Hello, and welcome back to the next Q learning tutorial. This time we're going over dueling deep Q neural networks. So if you have no clue what's going on here, we already have a bit of code. Uh, this is part of a tutorial series. You don't need to watch the other stuff. I will also go over just the theory of what dueling DQNs are. Um, but if you want to kind of follow along with the code and it's a bit confusing, definitely feel free to go back and check out the previous videos in the tutorial series. Uh, tutorial series. Um, otherwise, uh, or if you just want the theory, definitely tag along here as that's what we will be going over. So let's jump into it. Dueling DQNs, what are they? Why do we need them? How do they help us? So I actually want to start by looking at the paper. Uh, this is the original dueling deep Q neural network paper. Um, I'll link this in the description if you want to check it out. So we're going to go a little bit more into the fundamentals of Q values and how what they're comprised of in this video, uh, because that's sort of what dueling Q networks deal with. So I want to start off with a sort of thing right here. This They have this great uh, on the right here, this great visual. So what this is actually showing is the deep Q no network uh, right here on the top. You can see this is sort of what we have right now, right? We have some input. In our case, it's an Atari game breakout. And we use a few convolutional layers to reduce this down. We then use a fully connected layer to output the Q values for each action. So if we have two actions in uh, Atari left and right, I think we actually have four. I forget what the other two are for. Maybe no op and something else. Um, but if we have, you know, say four actions, uh, then we output four Q values. And let me remind you in case you've forgotten um, or you need a refresher, Q values are essentially, if we were to take this action, right, uh, whatever action we're looking at, and then continue taking actions based on the policy from there on out, and the policy deter is what determines which actions we take, right? It's ex how much reward or discounted reward uh, we would expect to get throughout the whole game or the rest of the game. Uh, so essentially a high value, a high Q value is good, right? It means that that action, if it has a higher Q value than another action, will give us ideally better results. That's the idea. Q values, however, can actually be broken up into two different parts. So let me scroll down here and show you what those are. The two parts are called value and advantage. Um, and you'll see this a lot if you look through reinforcement learning. Uh, value is probably the most fundamental of these. So here's value and it's the, uh, this is one way to write it. There's a lot of different ways to write it. And I know this is a lot of math, so I'll, I'll walk you through it. We actually, I'm gonna give you a more intuitive sort of definition here. Value is the value of a given state if we stay on the current policy. And remember policy, what actions we're taking. Um, or it decides what actions we're taking. So you might say, wait, isn't that exactly what the Q value is? The Q value is if we take an action and stay on policy, it's the expected like, you know, reward we'll get. Yeah, it's it's very similar. The key difference here, if you look at the Q value and the value function, notice the Q value takes in an action, right? So the Q value is essentially equal to whatever the reward in the current state is plus the value uh, the discounted value of whatever the next state is, right? Um, the only difference here is for the very first step, we're taking this action, whereas here the action and the value, the action is already decided by the policy. Um, so the Q value is actually equal to the value in the case that this action is sampled from the policy, right? That's what this means. Or if we are acting according to the policy, the Q value is actually equal to the value. They differ when we're using actions that are not on policy or off policy actions. So that's why we want to try and maximize Q value specifically because it differentiates between actions, which action is better than the others. But if we want to know which action is better than the others, we can actually break this down a little bit more than just values and Q values. And that's where this term called the advantage, a short for advantage comes in. And the advantage is the Q value um, of some state and some action minus the value in that same state. So essentially what this means is, right, imagine we are on a turn and breakout where we can go right and get the ball, um, or we can go and uh, break out Atari, right? It's kind of like one of these games where you have a paddle. Uh, of course, it's a Google one. 
you see we have this ball right here. It's the paddle you need to make sure you hit it with. Um, the ball is coming down. You know, if we're right next to the ball here, we might want to go right and get the ball. Or if we go left, we might miss it. So in that case, we could expect the Q value to be a lot higher if we go right, right? Because the value is going to be higher because that will, you know, hitting the ball will allow us to get more points and so on. Um, oh. Very specifically though, if we go right, let's assume right is our on policy action, right? Going right would be what our policy tells us to do because it's the, the better of the two actions. Um, well, the advantage of that would be zero, right? Because it's the Q value minus the value. And remember what I just told you, if we're acting on policy, these are equal to each other, the Q value and the value, which means this would be zero. So we'd have a zero advantage. Make sense? Um, if we were to go to left in this case and miss the ball, well, that's clearly worse, right? We can definitely expect the key value of that to be less. Um, and it's worse than the right action specifically. Uh, so we would expect this Q value to be lower and hence we would end up getting a negative advantage. And essentially what the advantage represents is how much better is an action as compared to another action. Specifically, the other action we're comparing it to is always the on policy action, right? So you can think of the advantage as a direct comparison between an action we want to take and what we would normally take. So if we're going to take an action that's better than what we would normally take, it would be positive. Um, if it's the exact same, it'd be zero. And if it's worse than what we would normally take, then we would get a negative advantage. So. This is really key, these sort of two new concepts, the value and the advantage. You can think of the value as the inherent state, uh, sorry, the inherent value or expected reward from a given state. And the advantage is given a few actions, it's the differences in value between those actions. And together, uh, if we, you know, we could rearrange this, we could add the value to both sides and we get the, uh, the advantage plus the value equals the key value. And this is sort of what you'll see and lots of these formal papers that sort of uh, broken down like this. These are sort of three uh, very important factors. So I just spent a while explaining that. So you might be wondering, is, you know, is this important? Where does this come in? And this is really the key concept behind the dueling DQN. Normally when we have neural networks uh, for deep Q learning, or at least up till now, we'd have this, right? We have convolutional layers up to a fully connected layer, and then we output uh, this Q, I can't highlight this, unfortunately. And then we uh, output a few Q actions, or sorry, Q values. What the Boolean architecture proposes, however, is that instead of that, we take the same convolutional layers, but once we get to the fully connected layer, we split it up into two different layers. In one of those, we have one output, and this will be our uh, predicted value. And on the other side, we have one for each advantage. These will be our advantages. Um, so we'd have the same number as actions. So maybe four in this case, two or four. Um, and then we add them together and we get the output Q values. So makes sense, not a huge difference, right? This is exactly what we were just talking about. The value plus the advantage is the Q value. And although this actually seems like a very small change, we actually see some pretty good improvements. Um, the reason for this being uh, sort of intuitively what this paper uh, sort of proposes, and it actually says this very specifically right here, intuitively this is supposed to be because sometimes some certain states, it doesn't really matter what action you can take, right? In breakout, we can see here the ball is pretty low, but if the ball is way up here, um, it doesn't really matter which way we move, right? Like uh, we'll probably be able to hit it either way. We, we aren't going to be too worried. So the reason this matters is because we want to essentially be able to differentiate uh, the value of a state versus the value of an action state. We want to sort of have more granularity over what we're predicting. The end result is still the same, but as it turns out, this sort of level of extra granularity in the latent space of the model ends up improving the results. Uh, if you want to know more about sort of why this works, I do have some more info in the paper you're more than welcome to read. Uh, the last two things I want to leave off with on this paper, though, are they have a really cool sort of graphic here. And what this shows is on the two left frames, we can see what the value portion of the network focuses on versus what the advantage portion of the network focuses on the right. So what you'll see at the value, it's looking way up here at these cars in the distance um, and the cars next to it. 
almost like it's trying to figure out how far ahead or behind it is in this race, right? Because the value of the current state is probably going to be very dependent on sort of your place in the race. Um, it also is looking at the score a lot. Makes sense? Whereas the advantage, you can see, is only very focused on the car right ahead of it. It doesn't care about the cars way ahead of it because the advantage is only focused on the current actions, right? Which action is going to be best? So we can see it needs to know if it should turn left or right to surpass this car. So makes a lot of sense. You can actually see this sort of visually here. So I thought that was really cool. The next thing I want to look at is sort of just the results. They have uh, a few results here. So we can see here for several Atari games on the left, you can see the name of the game. And on the right, you can see how much the dueling architecture improved it uh, from a base architecture. And you can actually see you know, there are a few that don't improve. Breakout is unfortunately one of those, um, but the vast majority of them do. That being said, uh, when I actually tried this out, you'll see I actually did get better results. So, you know, these can't always be trusted entirely, you know, uh, based on the implementation, things can change. So anyway, that covers the theory of it. Let's actually get into the code now. Okay, let's go down to our deep Q network. So this is the Q network here. Right now you see we output one layer of the, for the number of actions, these are our Q values. We're gonna wanna change this, right? The first thing we want to do is we wanna split this up. So let's say we have three layers, let's split it up after this. So specifically, we want to make two linear layers after this, right? So let's take this layer four, because this is already a linear layer, we'll just duplicate this. Um, so we'll have our value layer one and then our, let's say, advantages layer one. Cool. So we're splitting it up, right? This is the, if we scroll, oh my gosh, uh, all the way back up here. Uh, we're splitting up into these two separate fully connected layers now. Uh, so one of these will become one output, one of them will become multiple. So let's do that. So for the value, do self.value layer two. Remember this is just a linear layer. So this is 521, so we'll be inputting 500 or 512. Um, and we have one output, right? Because we only have one value per state. And here we'll have something similar, except for, this will be ad advantages layer two, and we will be outputting in X, right? Because we want one advantage for each action we have. There we go. That's our layers. Super simple so far. We're not done. <laughs> um, so now what do we want to do? Well, here, everything is the exact same up to layer four, right? But after layer four, we can do this. So uh, this is called key values. This isn't quite, quite right anymore. So I'm just going to call these Z. Uh, Z you'll often see used for latent spaces. Latent means like the in-between, by the way, the, the part you're not specifically using. Um, maybe it, mean, it might mean hidden. What is the latent? I think it means like sort of hidden. Existing but not yet developed or manifested. That's a much fancier way of saying it. <laughs> uh, anyway, so this is where we're going to do the split. So we can say values equals self dot value layer uh, one to C and then we have values equals value layer oh self dot value layer two values and this will get us our output one value per batch or no sorry not per batch per uh per state in the batch and then we next want to do the advantages so advantages equals self dot advantages advantages layer one and remember we're not taking in from the values we're, we're going back this is sort of where we're splitting off the z is the, the last part we're splitting off from um so we're just continuing off of that straight from this to this and then value or sorry advantages equals self dot advantages layer two and then we're taking in advantages the previous advantages layer and remember this will give us uh, one for each action awesome okay now there's actually one part after this that i didn't go over it was in the paper 
um, but it has to do with a bit of probability. Essentially what we're gonna do is we are actually going to take the mean of the advantages uh, for each batch and subtract them from all the advantages. The reason we do this has to do with probability. It has to do with uh, uh, essentially a property called identifiability. Am, am, am I saying that right? Identifiability, that's what I meant to say. Identifiability. If you want to read more about it, I just pulled it up in the paper. It's uh, it's this section right here. Um, I'm not gonna get too into that. It, I think that's a bit beyond what we should be going into. Uh, but essentially it helps stabilize the network and it ends up giving better results. Uh, so that's sort of the outcome of doing this and it's fairly simple. So let's do advantage means equals torch dot mean advantages equals one or dim equals one means we're doing this once over each batch. And then advantages equals ad advantages minus advantages advantage mean uh, dot advantage means dot view uh, make sure we have this in the right shape and now that we have our scaled advantages all we have to do to get the queues right is the q values should now equal the values plus our head Advantages, advantages. And there we go. I mean that, and yeah, it should be as simple as that, right? We have our values, one for each state, and then we are adding that base value to the advantages, which we have one for each action. And from that, we get our Q values. Awesome, there's actually not much more to do here. This is one thing that's really nice, and they even mentioned this in the paper, about the dueling architecture is that you don't have to change the algorithm. Essentially, almost anything that predicts a Q value can sort of add this change and usually see some improvements, which is really nice. So let's go ahead and run this and make sure that it works. I think I might still be running this from the last tutorial, am I? Oh, I was. Oops, let's uh, stop that. Uh, stop. Uh, kernel. Let's restart it. Let's start it from the beginning. If you haven't checked out the double uh, q lane tutorial, by the way, definitely check it out, some good content. Uh, so we're running this, let's just make sure we get an output. Oh no, what's going on? Local variable q value reference before assignment. Uh, let's see, z equals q values dot view. Ah, that is a mistake, isn't it? So come back up here, q values, ah, z equals z dot view is this. I just forgot to change that. Simple mistake. Let's try it again. There we go. It's training. Not bad, not bad. So this will actually take a while to train, but I want to show you my results. So let me drag in. This is sort of uh, my original thing. So let's go through this. Uh, and you can see I trained this and these were my results. Start off low. Um, and then we get all the way up to around 30, almost 40 at some points reward, which is really good. If you were sticking around for the previous tutorials, you saw we were only getting up to roughly 20. That being said, we did only train for a little less than 2,000 steps in those ones, uh, but they did stop improving around that mark, whereas this one can clearly go higher up to around 30, 35 before it starts tapering off and getting a, a bit crazy at the end here. But it's a... I mean, I, I think doing the Arduino architecture is really neat uh, just because you kind of get some crazy improvements in a whole lot of environments for a, a really small change. Um, I guess this isn't too different from the double key learning in the sense that it's a really small change that has a fairly decent sized effect on most environments. Anyway, that is all I wanted to share with you all about the dueling deep key network. Thank you so much for dropping by. Definitely drop a like and subscribe. If you thought this was helpful, I would really appreciate it. I will be having more Q-learning tutorials coming out. I have some really cool state-of-the-art uh, papers implementations planned soon. So definitely stick around. Thanks for joining, and I hope to see you next time.